OK, so first thing we're going to do is we're going to have a vote on uh, who sings it better. Now the first of December, it was covered with snow. Yes, and so was the turnpike from Stockbridge to Boston. The Berkshires seemed dreamlike on account of that frosting. With ten miles behind me and ten thousand more to go. A tremendous singing voice. I cannot forgive that moustache, though, even in 1972. <laughs> that was not an acceptable moustache. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> so, I guess, you know, the reason I always think of that song when I'm looking at learning analytics is that that's where I feel we are. We're making good progress. We have got 10 miles behind us. There are certainly things that we've achieved. But what we're looking to do is to go along that journey and I feel we've still got a long way to go to get to that sort of that magical transformation, which is what we're looking at, rather than the floor which has got plugs on it, which I'll try not to fall over. Um, <clears throat> so looking just very briefly, very quickly, at some of the uh, 10 miles behind us, we have got student dashboards in place. Maybe not everywhere, but there are student dashboards around, and they're becoming you know, increasingly popular in different formats that those might be in, you know, diff different styles. And we also have <coughs> learning analytics that the teachers are using to help drive their decision making and so on. Um, our friends from IntelliBoard have just shown you some very similar charts. So the question to me is how do we take those next steps? Now, <coughs> So to think about an example where analytics has been highly impactful, um, I, I think back to a Second World War story um, that's going around at the moment in the analytics world about where we saw some real impact. The Second World War was the first major conflict where military air power was seen as critical and proved decisive in the outcome of the war. But the Allied aircraft were taking significant amounts of damage in combat. Improving the survivability of the aircraft and their human crew was vitally important for the war effort. There was a real need. The Allied governments, and indeed the population as a whole, were only too aware of this need. They were fully aware that something had to be done, but it was not necessarily so easy to decide what. You couldn't reinforce a whole aircraft, it would make it too heavy. It would reduce its payload, reduce its range, reduce its speed and agility. So the question was, how best to reinforce the aircraft. To help answer this question, the Allies needed more data. And what better place to start than looking at the data of where and how the aircraft were being damaged. OK, so we had a clear need there. That was recognised at the very top of the organisation. Wouldn't we love to have our vice-chancellors, our DVCs, recognising that need? There was also an awareness of the need. So there's plenty of stuff you say to your, your vice-chancellor, your rectors. You say, there is this need. They'll say, yes, but it's not really very high on their agenda. So let's have a look at what the data showed. So I think there's an interesting story behind this. So, that's the sort of data they gathered during the Second World War. <clears throat> you can see there, you know, they've done an accumulation, this is just one example, of damage to the aircraft. But that's just data. What they needed was some analysis of that data. So, you know, the key question here is, where do I reinforce the aircraft? Does that data tell me? Fortunately, 
they decided to get the analysis done by, well, a mathematician, somebody who might now be called a data scientist. Um, so it wasn't surprising. Aircraft are coming back full of bullet holes. And the Allies sought to strengthen uh, <clears throat> the aircraft to increase survivability, but also maintain performance. Anyone suggest where you might reinforce those aircraft? Go on. Right. And why where there aren't bullet holes? Right. So all of the aircraft we're seeing are the ones that come back. So this is exactly what Abraham Walt, who may be a great-grandfather of yours or something like that, um, con concluded. So the key here is that without that analysis, just looking at the data, you could easily jump to the wrong conclusions. So I think there are those four elements, always good to have an acronym, especially an acronym in Spanish. Um, de nada is uh, what everybody seems to say to me. Uh, very nice, friendly people in Spain. So, what are those four elements that we, that we have? We have a need. So the analytics is powerful when we have a need for it. And we need awareness at a high level of that need. We need the data, and we need to do proper analysis of that data. And really, it's through that that we get the uh, tra transformation. Does anybody recognize that uh, transformation in that first language? It's not Russian. That's yeah, transformation in Ukrainian. Um, we have done a few languages here. It struck me, you know, this is a word that's very similar in uh, Portuguese, Hebrew, Arabic. Welsh, there is some Esperanto in there. I'm always rather amused when I look at those top three. That's transformation in English, German, and French. So three, uh, three countries which would see themselves as culturally very different um, all have the same word for transformation. So that, to me, is the key here to getting those analytics to transform our organizations. So... The question is, what is the need and awareness coming back into higher education? What are the themes, what are the things that make our senior managers sit up and pay attention? Because ultimately, that's where we want this information to be. We're not going to get them interested in how many rubrics there are in Moodle. So what are the things that they're going to be interested in? So what I do when I'm trying to solve this, is I have a look around at the places they are looking at. Uh, HEPI's a good starting point. We've got here a blog. This was written in August 2022 by the Vice-Chancellor of Surrey University. So this is recent. This is a senior leader in an R1, a research-intensive university. What's he concerned about? He's talking about employability. But he's making the very important point here that to him... Employability is not how many of your students get jobs. Because, let's face it, if you're at Surrey University, your students were pretty employable before they went there. They're going to get jobs afterwards. What he's looking at is how can we tell if they're getting jobs that have been enhanced or made possible by their study. <coughs> Happy has, you know, various things, various reports which are worth looking at. These are the types of things, hopefully, that your senior leadership are concerned with. Um, Universities UK, just looking there at what the different themes are. And this may be different in different universities. A couple there that stand out. Um, <clears throat> equality, that's very big at London South Bank. They're doing a lot of work to reduce inequalities. And the impact of universities. Now, I also had a look, as I frequently do, at the league tables. We have mixed opinions about the league tables. <coughs> they are important to institutions. If you look at this, you've got the familiar names there at the top. University of Oxford is top in this one. It might be third or fourth in the other ones. So those overall league tables are going to be very important there. But to my institution, where we're 800th, it's not so important just looking at that big one. It may be for some of yours, 
But if you look into that a bit, you can start to get some different pictures. So you look at the impact that the universities are having. We get some slightly different names here. Uh, Western Sydney University. Western University in Canada. So <clears throat> if you're at institutions of that sort, it may be that the impact is what's going to be important to you. Or we look here at the um, <clears throat> reducing inequality. And we've got um, University of Canberra up there, RMIT, and Western Sydney of there again, and London South Bank, my employer. So those are the sort of themes that are going to be interesting to the senior people in my organisation. And those are the sort of things into which I want to wrap those learning analytics. So, as I say, not going to talk to our senior leadership about you know, how many rubrics are deployed, but what we can talk to them about is how the use of Moodle is impacting on the things that are important to them. So this is the type of dashboard they may be looking at. <coughs> National Student Survey. This is a fictional university, by the way. Um, National Student Survey. This university, comparing this to sector performance, this university is not doing so well on National Student Survey. So can we wrap up into that data on how Moodle is helping to improve the National Student Survey results? How it's improving that feedback from students? The overall student experience, the success rate, the impact on league tables. These are the sort of things that if we can get our data from whatever tool you're using, so that it is appearing in those dashboards, so that it is influencing that number. We could all make the connection between, um, you know, the use of Moodle and the student experience. So what we've got to do is find ways that we put that data in so that our senior leaders are at least seeing the impact of those things on the factors that are important to them. So, I guess the question I'm putting to you um, is, you know, essentially help me on this. What are the themes that are important to leadership? I've picked out a few there. Uh, where are organisations on this journey? I would love to hear from people who've actually got this process working. You know, you've got the data from Moodle feeding into those organisational dashboards rather than just being seen as something separate that they may go and look at that a subset of people may look at. What are the barriers there? And are we actually pushing it open doors here? Does the leadership want to see this information, want to see this data, so that we can get it wrapped up and put into their senior, senior dashboards? So I guess that's where I leave it, I leave it with you. You can uh, get my contact details on here, and I'd love to get feedback now and any questions on what you think about these themes and what we've looked at today. How, how does the moustache compare, by the way, do you think, to James Taylor's? It's better, isn't it? It's better. <laughs> Surely not. Surely not. So we have, uh, thank you for uh, turning this over to the crowd. We have four significant questions here. Um, I would, I would like, uh, we would like to hear uh, your feedback on these significant questions. Is anyone ready to, to offer that? Should we have a think, pair, share sort of situation? So maybe we talk to each other for a minute? Uh, so one barrier I'd have a question about is um, we do um, courses that target lots of different areas around the globe, lots of different contexts, and it's sometimes difficult to you know, integrate all those different data sets into one and try and analyze them as one. Um, obviously, you don't always want to do that, but leadership often asks that. So what are some ways to maybe improve that type of analytics? Yeah, so I think the... <clears throat> I think the important thing here is when leadership asks us questions, we must try and give them the answer they need, which is not necessarily the question that they asked. So if they're going to say, yep, I want to see all of those courses, I want to see all of that data wrapped up, 
we can maybe say, well, look, given that we're looking at the impact on NSS, can we get you a data set that demonstrates how those courses impact NSS or indeed other uh, organisational goals? So we're giving them what they need, not necessarily what they ask for. And I think, you know, that's, that's where we have to be aware that's why it's so important to be aware of the types of things that keep them awake at night. What do they first think about in the morning? And if we can answer the questions that, <clears throat> that help to give them information on that, then I think we will get a much greater audience at a much higher level. But any other comments, feedback, questions? We always count to six. Because it takes the brain about six seconds to think of a question. No. Ah, yes. Six and a half. <laughs> so how do you not overload everyone with too much data? Like, how do you help to refine what data is useful? Yeah. So what I would say that is... <clears throat> That's where this sort of model is going to help you because you know your data. You probably know it in great detail. If you can refine it down to the data that impacts in one of these areas, so you've already done a lot of that refinement and you can then put forward a very simple number. The people to whom you're putting it don't need to know everything that's behind it. So they don't need to be overloaded. They just need to know that... Um, you know, courses with more rubrics get better scores on the NSS, something like that. And if you can put all of those factors, you know, that's taken. I, I created this. This is artificial. Um, but I just created this in Excel with everything being rated on a 0 to 10 scale. So if you can work out how you get your data into that 0 to 10 scale, then when they drill in, they will just see a very simple number which tells them this is good or this is bad we need to do more here or less here. Of course, it's easy to say, not so easy to do, is it? <clears throat> and, you know, this, this, I think everybody sees this as a long-term goal. I'm not going to go back next week and have all of this done. There's a lot of work, a lot of preparation to get there. <clears throat> 